2018 has been a year full of automotive anniversaries. We've had the 70th anniversary of Porsche as a company, as well as 70 years of Land Rover. But all of those pale into insignificance when compared to the anniversary of the passing of arguably the greatest F1 racing driver of all time. We're here in his birthplace of Kilmany in Scotland, and on this episode of Drive Tribe in Detail, we're going to be commemorating the late, all-time great, Jim Clark. Jim Clark won two Formula One World Championships in 1963 and 1965, but he didn't just excel in the world of Formula One. He drove in touring cars, Formula Two, IndyCar and sports cars. He actually won the Indy 500 in 1965 and came second at Le Mans in 1959, bringing him agonisingly close to winning the Triple Crown of Motorsport, which also includes the Monaco Grand Prix. The mainstay of his driving career was Lotus, at a time when Colin Chapman was continually pushing the boundaries of automotive engineering and producing championship winning cars year on year. Since this is Drive Tribe in detail, we're going to look at one of Jim's cars. Now we could look at one of his more successful cars like the Lotus Type 25 or the 33, but instead we're going to look at an oddball from the Lotus stable, one that's got one of the most interesting powertrains I've ever come across the Lotus 43 and its H16 engine. Although F1 is now constricted to V6 turbo powertrains, back in the day, the rulebook was much more open. In the 1960s, V8s were the bread and butter of the F1 paddock. BRM had a particularly good V8 engine, a small little 1.5 litre unit that Lotus used. The FIA then changed the displacement rules, saying that the maximum displacement of an engine could go up from 1.5 to 3 litres, doubling the engine size that you could use. BRM had such a good V8 engine that they thought, why don't we just double it? And since they were Lotus's engine supplier, Lotus would simply buy the engine BRM created and put it into their race cars. So after a ton of engineering and hours of dyno work, they ended up with the P75 H16. Starting with a 1.5 litre V8, the BRM engineers thought long and hard about how to meet the new regulations. First of all, they flattened the engine to become a 180 degree V8, not to be confused with a flat or boxer engine like I mentioned earlier. They then slapped another 180 degree V8 on top, and with the upper and lower engines having their own crankshafts, the two engines were connected by a gearing system. And due to the way this engine looked at the back, it became known as an H16. Most people don't realise that it was this car that first used the engine as a stressed member. That means that the engine becomes an integral part of the car's chassis, keeping it as stiff as possible. Everyone thinks it was the Lotus 49, but no, it was actually the 43. With the H16 came a hell of a lot of complications. First of all, each cylinder head had a twin cam system in it, meaning for two, four, six, eight cams in total. Then came the exhausts, four in total, two on the top and two on the bottom, but aren't they pretty? On top of those complications, the engine layout meant that it's essentially a two by two block of metal that under braking will have felt like it was coming over your shoulder. Also, 16 cylinders means more fuel, it means more water, it means more oil. It's all going to be circulating quite high in the car and disturbing the centre of gravity. The H16 produced 420 brake horsepower at 10,500 RPM. At the time, that was enough to take it right up there with the Ferrari and Honda engines in the field. 
This car is so original that some of the details are frankly amazing. On the leather seat, you can see the cracks and scars where Jim Clark's heels were denting into the leather as he was getting in and out of the car. There's also the tiny worn gear knob that Jim Clark would have been snicketing through as he was driving around the track. And also the worn leather steering wheel, which is cracked and scored due to Jim Clark's input. This engine did have one moment of glory, however, and unsurprisingly, it was at the hands of Jim Clark. Despite leaking fluids all over the start line, he managed to coax the H16 powered Lotus 43 to victory in the 1966 US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. It was the first and last time that he managed to get the H16 to last an entire race distance, sealing the fate of the new engine layout to the history books. But what that one win in the state showed was that Jim Clark was unbelievably talented at managing even the most challenging of vehicles by driving them smoothly and keeping the car's vitals in check. When the rest of the field would be changing general parts on their cars from one race to another, Clark's brake pads would last up to three times longer than any other driver. His tyres would also last four races, and his gearboxes barely needed any maintenance between race weekends. He was therefore very soft on his cars, which meant more often than not, his cars would last the race distance at a time when Grand Prix cars were anything but durable. Do not mistake that mechanical sympathy for a lack of pace, however. He won the 1963 Belgium Grand Prix at Spa by nearly five minutes and also won the 1965 Indy 500 by a whole two laps. Sadly, all of that talent was to go to waste in one of the most tragic moments in motor racing history. While driving a Lotus in a Formula 2 race at Hockenheim, Clark speared off the road and collided with a tree. It was the 7th of April, 1968, and Jim Clark died aged just 32 years old. It is thought that it was an exploding tyre, rather than a driver error, that led to the 170 mile per hour accident, with many touting Clark as being simply too talented to have made such a fatal mistake. It was a death that shook Team Lotus, the motor racing community, and the rest of the world. An icon of F1 was gone. Despite his relatively short time in the sport, Jim's win record is still one of the best. From 72 starts, he recorded 25 wins, making for a win percentage that's higher than the likes of Senna, Prost, and even Michael Schumacher. And yet despite his unbelievable talent behind the wheel, he was known to be extremely humble and shy, never succumbing to arrogance and always finding the utmost pleasure in returning to his family farm in the Scottish borders. And to commemorate the 50th anniversary of his passing, and as a Scotsman myself, I can only think of one way to truly pay tribute to the man that changed motor racing and Scotland forever. <laughs>